Good morning. My name is Ida Cahill, and today I'll be reading scripture from the new revised standard version of the Bible. Please open your Bible to the passage and read along with me. Today's reading comes from Matthew 5, 1 through 12. This is one of my favorite passages. I find it personally, emotionally uplifting, and it helps me to keep focused on what's really important in life. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who, are hung who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people will revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Our focus verses for today are verses 3 and 4. Hear them again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is the word of life. Good morning, again. As Ida said, today's sermon is going to come from verses 3 and 4. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those who mourn. Um, but before we begin, please pray with me. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy, pleasing, and sacred before you. Amen. What does it look like to be poor in spirit? What does it look like to mourn? When you think of being poor in spirit and be in mourning, what do you feel? One of my favorite things in the world to do is to go for walks in the woods. I just love how peaceful it is when the wind blows through the trees and when it feels like everything else in the world is just gone. It's just you and nature. So I want to try something with all of you. Picture yourself walking on a dirt path. And if you need to close your eyes to do this, feel free. You're walking down a path, looking for stones so that you don't fall, looking at the trees, you see some birds fly by, you happen to come across some deer. You're seeing the beauty all around you, and then bam, your foot gets stuck in mud. I don't know about you, but when this happens to me, I have this irrational fear that I will be stuck there forever. It almost feels like when you're taking off a sweater and your arm gets stuck, and then your head gets stuck and you panic for a slight second, like, oh my gosh, this is never gonna end. That's how I feel when I get my foot stuck in the mud. So anyways, bam, your foot gets stuck in the mud, and then the mud kind of sucks your foot as you take steps, so you take one step, 
and it's kind of uncomfortable, but you're like, oh, I've got this, and then you take another step, and then your shoe falls off, and you're like, maybe I don't got this, and then you take another step, and it gets harder and harder, and then you get hyper-focused, like, all I have to do is make it to the other side. Now, I want you to do the same thing, but picture your whole body encased in mud. Every time you take a step, another part of your body gets stuck. You take another step, and it sucks it back, and it feels like it's pulling you down. And you take another step, and every single step you take, it gets more tiring and more tiring. And you just keep fighting and trying to make it to the other side. When you think of this, what is your body feeling? Are you tensing up? Is your heart racing? Do you feel how exhausting this could be? This is what it feels like to be poor in spirit. At least, that's what it's felt like for me. The last three years have particularly worn me down. As many of you know, about three years ago, I almost died. I've been dealing with health complications since. I've been holding all of this grief. Grief for the life that I thought I would have, the experiences I thought I would have, my expectations of God. I'm grieving this new body of mine that I have absolutely no control over, and it happens to rebel against me at the most inopportune times. Plus the pandemic. And to top it off, my grandmother, who was my best friend, went through three months of suffering this last fall before she died. Yes, I got to take care of my grandmother and be with her in some of the most sacred moments, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. But it was really difficult, and it was like one final kick when I was already down. And all of this going on while being in school, working three jobs, continuing in my ordination process, so I know all too well what it feels like to be poor in spirit and to mourn. For a very long time, I felt like I, my whole being was encased in mud, and I was just trying to walk through, just trying to make it through. Meanwhile, everything in my body is being pulled back, and I was feeling exhausted. Even now, I think I might be on the other side, but I'm not quite sure. I feel like maybe I've made it to the other side of the mud, but I am face down in the ground, covered in mud, being like, what just happened to me? Now, for others, being poor in spirit might look somewhat different. You might be at a different process in walking through the mud. You might have a certain amount of resistance that other people don't have, or maybe you haven't been in the mud as long as others. But many of us are walking around, actively walking through the mud, just pushing forward until we feel like we are alive with a capital A again. It is important to note that being poor in spirit and mourning often go hand in hand with each other. I wouldn't say that they're synonymous with each other, but they definitely are entangled in some way. And to mourn doesn't necessarily mean that you're mourning the loss of a person. Yes, it could be a loss of a person, but it could also be dreams, experiences, expectations of life, time, expectations of God, expectations of others, expectations of yourself. And this is where the theme of forgiveness comes in, but I'll get to that in a second. And that's just on a personal level. I don't know about you, but I can't help mourn the state of our world. <laughs> I can't help but mourn the division that exists, the hunger, the diseases, the wars, the hatred against children and youth that exist in laws. And we also happen to be on the two-year anniversary, for lack of a better term, of the pandemic. Some of us are mourning the loss of experiences, time spent away from loved ones, mourning our former ways of life, our jobs, our expectations of how God might intercede, and we're mourning the loss of people. The World Health Organization recently released updated statistics on the amount of COVID deaths in the last two years. As of March 8, 2022, this last week, it was reported that since the pandemic began two years ago, there have been 6,004,400 and 21 people who have died of COVID worldwide. 
951,348 of those people are in the U.S. alone. So when I read, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, I feel jarred. I get kind of angry. Our common understanding of what blessed means to be, is to be happy, to be fortunate. You've received a blessing from God. Blessed? Seriously, Jesus? You're going to say, I'm blessed? If this is the price of being blessed, I don't want it. I want to say, take it away from me. There has to be something else here. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the context. I always hope that when I have questions like this, looking at the context helps me out. So the Gospel of Matthew is very interesting, and it's different in some ways than the other Gospels. Each Gospel has their own focus, and Matthew tends to focus on Jesus bringing an upside-down kingdom. This whole idea is that Jesus shows us the idea of a kingdom that goes against our thoughts of what a king, a kingdom, and power should look like. God, through Jesus, flips our thoughts upside down. At the time Jesus was living, the Roman Empire was in, a, was in control, and the empire was seeing an increase in wealth for some. But as there was this increase in wealth for some, a huge disparity was created between the rich and the poor. So on the one hand, you had the empirical culture, which focused on how, does, how do I, by myself, gain power? Then you also had the religious culture of the time. The religious leaders had a lot of power over the people's lives. And there we are. They had their own, uh, a lot of power over the people as well. They had their own expectations that a people should buy by, abide by. Some of these expectations were based on scripture, yes, but also just like any other religion, sometimes corruption comes into play. So you have laws and rules and expectations that are going against the scripture or speaking out of context. Essentially, a lot of the overall culture was about status and what you did and how you blended into society. If you did not blend in, you did not belong. The people, especially the poor, were pinned in between the expectations of societal culture and religious customs. Does this feel familiar to anyone? Well, this is what Jesus came and spoke into. He was seen as an advocate for the lower strata, which, was, which partially led to his eventual death, and he was seen as a friend to, re- to the rejected. And this is how he brought an upside-down kingdom. He changed the narrative in a way that shook society. That's exactly what we are seeing here on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus brought an upside-down kingdom simply by using the word blessed. As I said, the common understanding of the Greek word for blessed generally means to be happy, fortunate, to receive a blessing from God. Jesus Jesus alone is recorded to have used the word blessed 30 times in the Gospels. 13 of those times were in Matthew, and that's probably because of the Sermon on the Mount, where he says it over and over again. But a further look into the context shows that almost every time he uses it, it's it's in a way opposite of what we would expect. And then you zoom in even closer, and you find that this word is strategically placed in context that actually means to belong. So what if we add this new meaning to the passage? Instead of meaning you're you're being poor in spirit and mourning is a gift from God, what if it read something like this? To those who are poor in spirit, you belong. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you as well. To those who are mourning, you belong. You will be comforted. This completely brings a new sense to the narrative. What we see is, Jesus, is not Jesus telling people to get over their problems and to consider themselves blessed because they are going through trials. He's not dismissing their hurt or their pain. Rather, he's saying to them, you belong. Every part of you belongs, all of your hurt and all of your, your pain. You belong even when society says you do not belong. You do not need to pretend here. 
So what if we applied this to our society now? How often do we feel pinned between societal expectations and religious customs, which often seem to go completely against each other? Even in church, how often do we feel like we cannot be our full selves and cry before God? I have a professor who was diagnosed recently with stage four colon cancer. And she's a pastor and one of the most faithful people I've ever met. And she shared one of her struggles on Instagram. You can follow her story of cancer on Instagram. And in describing her first time back in church since her diagnosis, she said, I hadn't been back to church because when you fall apart in the house of the Lord, God doesn't mind, but it makes your neighbors anxious. When you fall apart in the house of the Lord, God doesn't mind, but it makes your neighbors anxious. How often do we hold back because we do not feel, or we do not want to make others feel uncomfortable, or we do not want to be seen in a certain way? How often do we hold back because we are not sure it's the proper way to address God? Jesus calls us to be our authentic selves and says that we belong in God's kingdom both here and in the future. Jesus calls us to be fully who we are and fully what we feel, and doing so has absolutely no determination of your fate. This is part of this provenient grace that is often talked about in the Methodist church. Nothing you do can earn you God's grace, and God's grace always goes before you, meeting you wherever you are. So if Jesus calls us to be our authentic self, and this includes in time of loss, in grief, times of mourning, and even in times when we need to forgive and we need forgiveness. Oftentimes when we are poor in spirit or mourning, it's because of a loss. Now we can bottle up this grief and hide it away as much as we want, but eventually it's going to seep out in other ways and it's going to hurt those around us, sometimes those we love most. During these times, we might think, and this, sorry, this is when forgiveness comes into play. I know at times we are reluctant to acknowledge this pain that God does not meet our expectations. We experience loss of mourning, or loss of spirit or mourning, and we might think, nope, it is God's turn to repent this time. Sometimes this is the hardest thing to acknowledge because we do not feel like we're allowed to express it. I was recently reminded of this, of Jesus' example in being authentic before God. I've been really angry at God. And all of it stemming from the reasons that I felt poor in spirit and why I was mourning, which I mentioned earlier. So I found myself in class one day, and my professor told us to hold, she said, hold your arms out like you're on the cross, mirroring Jesus. And the whole idea was to illustrate that you should be like Jesus and embrace your congregation in your ministry. I didn't want to put my arms up. I was really just angry, and my professor noticed. She looked at me and gave me that look that all teachers give, like, you need to do what I'm telling you to do right now. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) She gave me that look, and I was like, ooh, I better put my arms up. So I reluctantly held my arms up like this. But rather than thinking of embracing people, I could not help but cry out the words that Jesus cried to God. My God, my God, Why have you forgotten me? Forgiveness is a journey. It takes time. It takes different forms. In being fully who we are, this involves feeling everything that we are meant to feel. Jesus' upside-down kingdom that he talks about is not just about his disciples, but for us as well. He calls us to be authentic, to be honest. He does not say you will never be poor in spirit. He doesn't say you're never going to mourn. He doesn't say forgiveness is easy, but he promises that in those times, all that you are belongs, and you are not alone. You will be comforted. So what do we do with all of this? This is a lot. Here are some of the things that I've learned over over time, and it is by no means perfect, but it's something that's worked for me and something that my professors and others in my community, resources, people in my community have given me that have helped a lot. First, I encourage you to think about the places in your life where you feel poor in spirit or things that make you mourn. For me, it helps to write these things out. Then when you feel like it's safe and when you feel like you're able to, present this list to God. 
Do not hold back. (laughs) God can handle it, and God yearns for a relationship with us when we share all of us completely who we are. Second, I encourage you to begin this process of forgiveness in some way. Not everyone is ready for forgiveness, and that is okay. Some have been hurt way too deeply. Even if you are in a place where you cannot forgive, you are on the forgiveness journey, and you are not alone. It takes time, and it's not going to change overnight. And lastly, I encourage you to reach out to others. If someone in the congregation says to you, hi, how are you? Don't just do this simple pleasantry of, oh, I'm fine, how are you? Okay, bye. We all do it. If, be honest. If somebody says to you, hey, how are you? Say to them, not so good. I'm really not doing okay. And if you're the person hearing this, Try to respond if you feel like you can, or if you feel like you have a relationship where you can say to them, what's going on? This is a church. It's a community. It offers a place for us to be honest with each other because we are not meant to live this life alone. Even Jesus had help carrying his cross. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. It's not the easiest thing to do, especially when it comes to forgiving God. Whatever you are feeling, may we be fully who we are before God. You belong. Every part of you belongs here. With all of your hurt and with all of your pain, you belong even when society tells you that you do not. You do not need to pretend here. Amen.